Hello, welcome back to the Tegua YouTube channel. We thought we'd make a video about Suki, considering we've had the car now for quite a few years and uh, she's not really had a feature, we thought we'd, uh, we'd do one. So, I'll start with a bit of history about the car. We bought the car back in 2019 um, because myself and Johnny wanted to have the ultimate Honda race car. Um, we kind of decided that the ultimate Honda race car was of course the NSX. So at the time we were doing club enduro racing, so we built the car to be an endurance race car. Um, luckily, when we were searching for a car, we found one that had a blown up engine, but already had a really good roll cage um, and lots of other good suspension components. So it was kind of a really good base to start the build. Uh, as it didn't have an engine, and obviously Tegu was famous for case swap parts, we decided to case swap it. So the first engine that we put into it, uh, just to get things going, was a K20, just with light mods, some cams, and a couple of other bits, making 240 horsepower. And we did this just so that we could get the car going, get all the suspension set up, and go and see what it was actually like on track. Um, this car then ended up uh, being rented out to a couple of people for Club Enduro, and we saw the potential was crazy because at Spa, the middle sector, even though it was only a low performance car, it was the fastest car in the middle sector at Spa. So we knew as soon as we put a proper engine into it, it was going to be, uh, be a bit of a flyer. In uh, 2020, we decided to enter Time Attack, partly because we thought it was going to be good for Tegua because Time Attack is what we do, performance car parts and all the modified scene. So uh, Skunk2 kindly helped us out with a K24.5 NA engine. Uh, this was a high compression engine and it made 320 horsepower with obviously all of the Skunk2 Ultra cams, intake, um, crank, all of those components. And this transformed the car. It was an absolute flyer. And in fact, that first season we won almost every round of the Time Attack uh, two-wheel drive club class. So we were over the moon with the car. Um, sadly, because of COVID, we didn't get a chance to use the car in any endurance racing or anything else. So it was purely just Time Attack. But yeah, it was great fun and, and worked really well. At that point, we were still on the standard gearbox and it was just about holding up. Obviously, the third and fourth gear synchros were struggling a little bit as they do with high powered K20 engines when you start racing them. We then decided that because we'd had such a successful season of uh, Time Attack, we thought we'd turn it into a true Time Attack car and add a lot more power. So we did this with a Rotrek C38R. Um, this isn't a very popular supercharger because it's such a high powered one. And in fact, it needs to use a 10 rib uh, auxiliary belt, which we managed to get off an MAN truck. So it just shows how much performance the supercharger can give. So we did this through the winter and ended up getting some good power figures. We got to 570 horsepower um, on the dyno and, and it seemed to be great. But obviously this brought a whole new load of problems with uh, the gearbox and intake temps and everything else. So we had to switch to a sequential gearbox that could take more power. Um, so we went with a satchel. and. Then we went off racing in 2021. Um, this year wasn't really too good for us because they, we just couldn't get the car to work. The supercharger was making the intake temps too high. The gearbox wasn't taking the performance. Uh, so it was all a little bit of a, of a trying year for us all. <clears throat> so anyway, we put that behind us and then went to a turbo build. Um, by this point, we were um, using Born HPP to build an engine. So we'd gone to a K22 with all of their components, their cams, their valves, their valve springs. They had some custom pistons made for us, a custom crank. Um, so it was all a, a very well-built, high-performance engine. 
You can read about that in Race Engine Technology magazine. Um, as it, there's an eight page feature all about the engine itself. But we did this so that then we could fit a turbo. Uh, we went with a Garrett G3770, which as the name suggests, it's capable of 770 horsepower, which is obviously quite a step up from where we were. To help us sort the, all the cooling issues and everything we had with the supercharger, we went way bigger with a CSF water to air um, charge cooler. So we've now got a 12 inch by 12 inch by six inch cooler um, which has proven to be amazing because the intake temps don't ever go above 35. Uh, with the supercharger, we were having to use water meth to try and control it, which was good, but it still was reliant on something else just to keep the temps in a safe range. We then had the whole car relined with Goodridge G-Line. Um, this was partly because I was nervous about the whole turbo car setting on fire thing that seems to happen. So. Uh, Goodridge um, made the whole, the whole car with G-lines, including the fuel, the oil, the water. So uh, everything looks amazing and is ultra reliable and also it saved us a lot of weight because those lines are actually a lot lighter than the traditional um, AN lines that we were using. All the rest of the plumbing was done by Andy Frost at IceFab. Uh, he's local to us and he's an amazing fabricator. So he actually did everything from the exhaust manifold all the way back to the tailpipe and then all of the charge system, so the boost pipes and et cetera. Um, and we used the vibrant HD clamps just because they're the ultimate in sealing. Um, and we didn't want to have any issues with boost leaks with silicon pipes or anything. The guys at Funk have helped us out with some of their uh, Funk Motorsport gold heat reflective tape. Um, this has worked great all over the chassis. And then we've also got one of their blankets on the turbo. We've had Imico use their high quality insulation system on all of our exhaust components, which has massively reduced the uh, overall heat of the car and the heat of all of these components. The engine is ran on a life racing ECU. Um, this is tuned again by Bourne HPP and the ECU is incredible, the amount of controls it's got. So any issues at all, the car goes into limp mode or shuts down entirely. This has obviously caused us a few issues to start with whilst we were getting things set up because we were uh, verging on the side of caution just to make sure that nothing went wrong. But now it's incredible and uh, it gives us all of the data and also it can be uh, live tuned really easily. This ECU also controls the gearbox. We're still on the uh, satchel gearbox at this point which is controlled by uh, compressor and the life racing paddle shift system, which works really well. The gearbox is only rated to uh, 500 newton meters of torque, so we've had to cap the power back massively. Um, we've done this with using a Turbo Smart PowerGate 60, um, and we actually use compressed air to control it. So we don't use a spring as a conventional way, we use compressed air to open it and close it which is obviously all controlled by the Life Racing ECU. So by doing this means that we can get to the, uh, the peak performance of the, the gearbox allows us to and then control it perfectly. Uh, we've got switchable maps as well. There's three different maps at the moment, obviously because we can only go to that sort of power. Our best map is 500 horsepower and 500 newton meters of torque. And then we've got a, like a bedding in map, which is about 400 horsepower and then one somewhere in between. We're using a competition clutch uh, twin disc, which is more than capable of taking the power we've got. And in fact, when we first fitted it, I was amazed how good it drives. When you look at the clutch, you think it's going to be horrific and it's going to be very jumpy on and off the line. But it's amazing. You can pull out the pit garage at low RPM and drive away and it's, it's lovely. So I'd, I would definitely happily have one on a road car. Kruger Engineering made us some drive shafts and they've actually been the same shafts that we've had now for a good few years and they've been incredible. And when we go next year to a, our new gearbox, we'll get them to build us some more. Um, the new gearbox we've got coming is a Hollinger MF two-wheel drive. We went with the Hollinger because after looking through all of the different gearboxes available, this seems to be the best two-wheel drive um, gearbox for the power. It's rated to 700 Newton meters of torque, which is obviously a big jump up from where we are now, which means we'll be able to unleash the full power of the engine. 
because at the moment we're only running at 1.3 bar of boost and we're capable of going to 1.8 and making 700 newton meters and 700 brake horsepower. So yeah, looking forward to using that. It should be good fun. The car is on some Nitron NTR3 coilovers. We had a few issues to start with, with the balance of the car, which actually caused a few uh, um, spin outs and stuff because the spring rates were completely wrong. However, we've managed to tailor that now to the car and the car handles incredibly. Uh, the adjustability as well on them is really good. So depending on if it's wet or dry, we've got a good range of adjustability. We're on yellow speed brakes. Uh, we've got 356 mil fronts and 330 mil rears with Paget RS29 pads. These pads work really well. They're an endurance pad. Um, however, we are trying some pad with a bit more bite. Um, so yeah, we'll work out where we're gonna go with that. We also have a Bosch Motorsport M5 ABS system. We fitted this because after the first season of racing, we found that we were getting quite a lot of front lockups. And obviously as the engine is near the back of the car, the front's quite light. With the big power, the slicks, we didn't really, well, I didn't really want to have any lockups and it just took a bit of the vulnerability away from the car. We actually solved the problem by changing the master cylinders with some different AP master cylinders. And now I don't got lockups anyway. So the ABS is there just as literally a, a safety gap. Um, so turned right down to level 11 out of 12. It, it doesn't really come in unless it's a actual emergency. The suspension arms are very much the same as they were from a factory road car. However, some have been replaced with spherical bearings where the bushes were a bit weak. Um, and we've also got some adjustable hard race camber arms. The car is also on a yellow speed racing air jack system. We put this on initially because it was going to be an endurance car, but actually now it's made the car so easy to work on in the garage. And especially as we go into getting aero, we won't be able to get jacks under the car. So the air jacks will become vital for that. When we first built the car, we built it on 17s um, because we didn't think we could get anything bigger under the, under the wheel arches. However, we had some front wheel arches made, which allowed us to get on 18 inch wheels all around. The car from factory comes staggered. So going 18s all round was a bit of a, uh, a leap of faith. However, it's improved the handling of the car massively. We've got 265 width rear tires and 235 front tires, and the balance works really well. We're on the Wedsport TC105X, which is the lightest or uh, definitely one of the lightest wheels you can get in a, an 18 inch by nine wheel. Um, and they're a flow form wheel, so they're really strong as well. So we're inside the car now, uh, and we've got a few things to, to go through. Um, I guess to start with the steering wheel. So this was a, an OMP steering wheel, and then the boys at Tegra managed to make a custom carbon plate for it. And it's got all of the buttons on that I need to use. So we've got the torque for the radio, we've got the windscreen, demister, uh, we've got the headlights, because with time attack, you have to drive with the headlights on when you're doing a fast lap, or off when you're doing a slow lap. Uh, wipers and then indicators and at the bottom I've got these two fancy knobs which are new for this year traction on the one knob and on the other knob we've got um, the map switch which is actually for the engine cowls so like I said before we've got three calibrations at the moment we've got the carbon paddles for the gear shift um, and they they're positioned perfectly so that literally I don't need to take my hands off to shift gears an aim dash which we use to display all of the engine data but it also has alarms. So 
at the moment it says oil pressure low obviously because the engine's not running but whilst I'm driving I can see various alarms depending on intake air temps have gone high or oil temperatures high or whatever. In the centre console all of the kind of um, initial turn on switches as well as the Bosch ABS um, position switch which in the wet does get messed around with quite a lot because too much ABS and it's like a road car and you just can't get any performance and then too little obviously in the wet you just skid but in the dry the big tyres the actual ABS is very um, doesn't need to be used an awful lot and then we've got our Garmin Catalyst which is incredible for our uh, uh, data and lap timing obviously the aim dash does date do all the data logging but we haven't got a smarty cam so we use the Garmin for all of the kind of driver data it's incredible because it's a, a bright screen and it's green if you're going fast and red if you're going slower and then afterwards you can just unclip it and uh, and look over what you've done and it shows the positives and negatives of, of your lap compared to your other best lap the seats we've then got a Cobra carbon super light uh, seat which they've actually custom fit to me the seat that we had in last year was actually too big it was just a standard off-the-shelf seat and with the the G that we get now in the corners I was kind of wobbling around quite a bit so this seat is nice and tight and in fact it's even embroidered Suki uh, and as a passenger with it being time attack we have to have a passenger seat so we went between the rules and uh, decided that we could use a, a little lightweight fiberglass go-kart seat as well as a set of Takata harnesses for both me and the go-kart seat we've got an OMP uh, lightweight fire extinguisher in the passenger footwell as long, along with all of the other air shifting system which as I said was used for the paddle shift itself but also controlling the um, gate for the boost the life ECU is also mounted in here as well as all of the, the relays and this big handbrake in the middle again time attack rules specify you must have a handbrake down by the pedals I've got a brake BIOS uh, adjuster so I can adjust the, the brake BIOS depending on how it's feeling and in fact on the dash I can also see the brake BIOS I'm getting so I don't need to solely rely on feel I can actually see the percentage of, of BIOS that I've got um, I've also got on the dash tyre temps which is great for time attack because um, obviously the ultimate tyre temperature takes a good few laps to come in so I can work the tyres hard and know when they're up to temperature ready to do a push lap I use a Stilo ST5 helmet um, which has got comms built into it so the talk button uh, links to our radio and we can talk back to the pit and all of the other mechanics so I can prep them for what's going on or in return they can spot space for me on the track and give me feedback whether I should have a slow lap to build some space or whether I should push to get past whoever's in front of me so now moving on to the exterior uh, as you've probably noticed there's a big girl on the side of the car we uh, decided to go with an Atasha livery because previously the car was in a very racy red and white theme um, and we thought being a, a time attack car and uh, trying to be very Japanese orientated we'd do this so we managed to get a designer to design us a character and the car uh, so we've called it Suki so the girls called Suki and the cars called Suki and it all works together quite well so yeah as you can see that's the wrap um, on the car we've also got a few light aero mods uh, we've got a, a front splitter that is still from our original club enduro spec so the it's a very small splitter um, we've actually now had some aero analysis done by AMB and that shows that the front splitter makes us 80 kilos of downforce so gives us a little bit but nothing really worth talking about we've got a uh, aftermarket front bumper as well because the front bumper is a lot um, more aerodynamic and has a better radiator duct the, uh, the boys at Tegawa, Andy Ford has made some carbon canards for us yet to test those really but um, yeah we've fitted those the wider wings like I say to take the bigger wheels uh, these worked really well um, 
before that we could only get small 17 inch 225 tires on so now we're onto big uh, 18 inch 235s which has made the the braking and handling far better the bonnet is a fiberglass lightweight bonnet that's vented and we've actually molded in um, the headlight skins because a standard the nsx has pop-up headlights we obviously didn't want those because of the drag and the weight they were actually seven kilos per headlight so we've made a one-piece bonnet now that that does away with those and then we've got small spotlights on the front of the car we've got full plastic windows all around including the windscreen this is for uh, lightweight but also for safety so that they don't get smashed small lightweight low drag wing mirrors um, some larger side pods we use the side pods to help um, feed air to the engine uh, to for cooling gt500 style uh, carbon scoop that actually feeds the huge air intake now for the turbo uh, and works really well again on the air analysis we can see that both the side scoops and the roof scoop do get good uh, air pressure then we've got uh, a carbon rear wing that was again back from the club enduro days um, it's generating about 100 kilos of downforce again so not an awful lot but a little bit and the rest of the car is standard obviously as you can see it sits quite low and on the uh, the weds TC105X wheels. So as I mentioned, we've had AMB involved in designing some aero. Um, so stay tuned with the blog for that because for next year, the car's gonna have some pretty heavy aero on it. Um, we're aiming to get about 1.5 ton of downforce at 150 mile an hour. So the car will be completely transformed from front to back. Uh, a huge wing on the back, a diffuser, flat floor, and a big front splitter. So stay tuned for that. Thank you for watching our feature. Please like and subscribe our channel. And I'll see you again soon.